So everybody, please welcome Sveta Ezenas. Thank you. Um, is this one? Yeah. Uh, so I'm, that's me, I'm from the Debian project. So I'm biased in other ways. So if you have experience with other distributions and what they're already doing, that I don't know, please contribute. So, um, let's see. What's the Linux distribution? Just so we clear what we're talking about. Um, so, the, uh, I think, what, what most of us spend most of our time on right now is integrating very open source software into some system that works well together. And we have policies, file systems, standards, and then much other things like that. So that is uh, what we're currently doing. I think what actually started more is to actually get the software to the user. Right now, that's pretty easy because everyone has internet. But it it used to be more difficult. And actually, the original Linux distributions didn't have a lot of uh, sort of policies or well, a nice integration. They just had some binary toolbox perhaps and put it on a uh, medium and ship it to the user. So that that is another task. And the uh, to some degree, the the uh, third task of, of Linux distributors is to sort of be the implementers or the guardians of, of freedoms that. You know, various organizations such as the Free Software Foundation or the Open Source uh, Initiative have defined, you know, they put them on, on paper or on the internet, but it's actually the distributors who you know, have to or should follow that and then actually provide those uh, freedoms to the user. So, and then the other part of the uh, talk is what, what is a cloud, and there's a bunch of, uh, a bunch of definitions around them. So this is my definition. No, um, so this is something I, I, I pulled together from somehow. So it's provisioning of services hosted on shared resources over the internet. So there's a couple of parts here. One is sort of the provisioning, which is the same as sort of distributing, perhaps, and the uh, hosting on shared resources. So there has this virtualization and stuff like that goes into that. And then this whole thing happens over the internet. And then there's also these things called private clouds which is then not over the internet. So you basically have the provisioning and share resources and virtualization in your own data center perhaps. That's it's called a private cloud. So um, the so this might have been the first main distribution maybe 15, 20 years ago. So that, that that's what people did back then, right? They took binary totals and put them on the copy disks and then send them around, or the alternative, perhaps, if, uh, if to this is that's what I'm, uh, I'm actually not old enough to remember these, but uh, so that, that's what you did back then, right? You just sort of downloaded over the telephone network, and then you wanted to install Linux or some good operating system locally. Um, that, so that, as, 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 as I said, that was sort of the task of the early Linux distributions to, to get the software out there. Then what people started doing is, is put these things into kind of disks, I guess, into boxes like this, and uh, you know, a bunch of other ones also like this. Um, that you can recognize the layout. And uh, you know, put manuals in there, then you can pull them, you can ship them around, or you can, uh, you can buy them in the, in the shops and bookshops. I don't think that actually that exists anymore uh, to a large degree. You can probably still order them, but I don't think you can buy them in the bookshops. And then as the, as the stuff grow, then you use these kind of media, and if they kept growing, you know, first it was CDs, and now it's like this many CDs, or you use DVDs, and then there's like five or six, I think, but then you, and, uh, well, I guess you can use blue right now, and it's just one. So, but, you know, this is just uh, accumulating, 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 but uh, it doesn't really um, sort of uh, help people, because the the latest uh, sort of devices that we have now, they don't actually have CD drives anymore, right? they're small networks, so what do you, how, how do you install these? Well, I think probably two or three USB sticks, but you can't actually, uh, well you could, but you don't really sell or distribute the USB sticks, right? You, people buy them themselves and then they have another device or image on them and move from that and delete the thing. So it's just a <coughs> actually nowadays if you don't have a CD drive anymore. 
So that, that's that's sort of where we're now, and, and certainly this will continue to exist, right? Because you still need to install your desktop or your laptop. There's still people in other parts of the world who don't have you know, broadband internet, and then you just want to you know, put some learning software at their school computers, and that's what they have completely differently infrastructure. But uh, what uh, what we have now mostly is this sort of this at home, right? This is a uh, DSL, so we, we, we can just basically download everything. We don't need any media anymore. Yeah. But um, then you have these sort of things. And uh, so how, how do you install these? Obviously, people do that, and there are solutions for that. But it's all ad hoc made up. And you don't, well, these, well, these mostly have CD drives. CD drives and then so you can move them yourself, right? And uh, then people will write like, some automation for that before they want to do it. But, so what the cloud idea now is actually, this is not your data, so this is Amazon or Rackspace or something. They, um, first of all, you don't go there until they install yourself. And uh, they do give you some pre-made images, and you can just install that there. And then, but then that's what they tell you you can use. Of course, you can also install your own, but you have to sort of make that up yourself again. Or oh, another thing that's sort of uh, uh, popular right now is, is virtual, very special virtual blocks that you want to run uh, locally. And, uh, and uh, how do you install these? Well, I think the way it works right now is actually you download the ISO image and sort of mount the ISO image in that thing and uh, maybe pull it up as a regular operating system, which seems kind of stupid actually. Because you can just, maybe you should just be able to download virtual box images and just have it. That obviously exists because you just put it up, but maybe that should actually be sort of something a Linux distributor actually just gives you as sort of a primary product instead of the nice image. Because it's, it's installing these sort of things locally, you know, you fire a virtual box and you download the thing, you mount it in, you boot it up, you boot it up again, and then you sort of have it installed in the software again. And so that seems kind of ridiculous to take it a half an hour, and maybe you should just be able to download these things instead of the one minute. So there are some solutions for that. So you just first you make up something yourself. But every data center probably has something like that. You know, have images and VMware sells something or make something up. So there's a bunch of things available, but it's just sort of completely uh, diverse. Some interesting sort of approaches that are also free software and it somewhat well integrated with the uh, Linux distributions is a good example sort of from the Debian world, but they also support other operating systems. FAI and Phi is fully automated installation. If you want to check that out, that's the URL. That, uh, that sort of works that way. You set up a server and put some images and configuration there, and you boot up all the machines, and they fetch this stuff via DHCP <coughs> and TFTP and so on. And so on. But that, that works maybe for your own data sample, but it doesn't really help you if you want to put stuff in the cloud because you can with your own DHCP or and, and, and these sort of things. So it doesn't really work. So as I mentioned, you know, it, maybe that's sort of a, a new idea to, to think about now. Instead of, or in addition to, just putting out ISO images, why not just sort of distribute, in some way it needs to be figured out, obviously, to just have sort of <coughs> virtual box images or some standard Problem is there are no standards really for that, so that needs to be worked out. But why not distribute sort of virtual box images as if, if, when you make a release? For example, you can download them, put them on the machine, stab in one minute. Or do some in, instead of you know downloading images of various kinds, you just have some kind of service integrated in your Linux distribution offering website, something. You say, well, I want a machine and Put it there. That's where it should go, right? That's the, sort of the promise of the cloud. You can be up and limited. You obviously have to set up you know, an account with Amazon and make sure you can pay them and so on. But once you have that, you can just say, well, this is what I want, put it there. And, it doesn't. and this actually exists. Um, this is actually, uh, I, have, I don't work for a good it's just something I found. So, and, and this is pretty much actually what this is, and this, I, I think, is where things are going to go. So this is, uh, I think it's actually called the Ubuntu Enterprise Cloud, or Ubuntu Tunnel, 
it's based on the free software. So now, what is this? Like, this is basically how it works, right? You install this sort of management thing, and uh, you set up an account with Amazon. And, uh, or you can have a private cloud. And then you just, you know, have sort of web interface, and you just sort of like, what this? And I want a new instance. Well, I can't really see that. I want a new instance. It's that name. Maybe set up some access key or some password. And do some pre configuration. I say, well, oh, that's my machine. And uh, that works. It's, uh, and I don't know if anyone else actually offers that right now, but I think that's sort of where things are going to go. Anyone know this? So problems I mentioned is, uh, well, there are some emerging standards, you could say, but there's no real standard. I mean, this, is a, this is an image format that you can sort of deploy or something like that. There are some leading vendors, right, like Rackspace or Amazon, or Lana, that sort of are defining this. And presumably, in, in a few years, I've heard some standardization of will come out of that. We, we don't know right now. There are some libraries around, like libvirt, for example, that can abstract that away somehow. And this is actually used also with this uh, Ubuntu and various other pieces that abstract that away. But obviously, when the next vendor comes out, you just have to adjust it. There's still uh, some degree of locking. So the other thing, there's a bunch of software out also. Um, free software that can manage all that, right, to actually to put it there, to query what's there, to manage the whole thing, to do monitoring, there's a bunch of things being uh, emerging now. But they're also out there, as is typical, right? There's on one website, there's on the other website, you can put them all sort of together and download them and try to fit, fit them together. And, uh, that's a lot of work. And uh, so as I mentioned in the beginning, so Linux distributions ought to uh, be the integrator of that. And, and that's uh, surely already happening, but uh, needs to do uh, more that uh, should happen. But you just say, you know, I download the latest of X, and it has all the software, just click around and have something. So, and it's not going to be easy, but that's, I think, where things are going to go. Another problem, I think, with most of this is these are all web applications. Hackaging of web applications has traditionally been a problem for various technical reasons, and people are sort of you know, by now afraid of them because they have you know, security problems and this and that. So packaging web applications is a bit of an underlying problem there, perhaps. So here are some um, links that contain other links to other links to interesting uh, ideas about this. So this eucalyptus thing is the uh, of the leading, I would say, sort of the leading most popular provisioning management software, I suppose. That's actually what runs this sort of Ubuntu cloud thing. And that's open source. You can you know, download that yourself, actually set up this whole thing yourself. You need to staff it and the same thing. And there are some this, two blog posts that I found interesting. They have lots of 11 open source cloud computing projects to watch contains links to other sort of software that support this, and here's another interesting blog for us who can it. So that's uh, sort of part one of this. Any questions so far? So the second part of this is the Linux stuff. Um, so to some degree, right, Linux is now leading server operating system, leading method operating system. Desktop has been always a bit of a problem, and maybe it was a year of the Linux desktop. And about two, two years ago, I think 2008 was sort of, I think, when the Linux desktop was actually there, when all these netbooks came out. I mean, most new netbooks had some Linux going on, and then two months later, they all switched back to Windows. So that was sort of the peak of the Linux desktop. Um, but actually, Linux desktop is, is here now, but it's not what we really uh, perhaps hoped for. It's going to look like this now. And uh, that is, for those, those of you who don't recognize it, that's uh, Google uh, Chrome OS. 
space on Linux, you know, and if you go through the checkbox, and it's like all free and open and everything. But it doesn't actually contain any software, because all of the, well, actually, all of these applications that they put there are just websites that you can buy. That is, of course, the way Google wants to go. And then that's not because you know, they want to, maybe it's because they are evil, but they claim they're not evil. Um, so that, I guess you can go see this is Gmail, Hotmail, Yahoo Mail, Google Calendar, Google Reader, Google Docs, YouTube, Picasso Web, it's a sure application, there's a bunch of social webs that I don't recognize so much. To-do list, some calculator, I wonder if the calculator is actually local. But, uh, so books, chess, Facebook, Twitter. So that's, you know, that's the applications of the future, I suppose. And uh, so this is obviously Google's um, way of, of the way they think things are going to be. But if you look around, maybe you give a Linux desktop to you know, some family member, and uh, I've done that, and they, they started using it without any problems. And that's not because you know, LX, LXDE is so the most user-friendly thing in the world. That's just basically because what they use is Firefox and uh, OpenOffice, basically, right? And then, so even if you're not sort of Google, this is what people out there are actually using, you know, not the hackers that have you know, the eye and the terminals and compilers. But this is what people are actually using, so this is where things are going to go. But um, where does it actually leave um, Linux distributors? Because what you actually ship to the user now is basically just a, the frame around this, right? And then you don't have any control over what these things actually are. And so if, where, where does that leave us and the goals we are, right? We don't have anything to distribute anymore except the box around it. We have no nothing to integrate. We have no control over any of the freedoms that we uh, were uh, supposed to enforce or implement or provide. So here, those problems basically. You have server-side software that is not free usually. There are sites, you know, where the software is technically free, but there are some other ones because you don't. Know, when they tell you, well, this is the software; it's free. You can download it and do it yourself. But, you know, maybe the hosting is not free. I don't know if, what could that mean, but because. Um, they can tell you this is the source, but you don't know if that's actually the source they're running, or if they have any extensions in there, or not. You don't know what's happening to your data, and uh, you know even if they say, "Well, you know, we protect your privacy," this and that, as you all know, there's always leaks, and this and that, and they change the policies and so on. There's no open source community in the sense, you know, there's no peer review of things that are going on. You don't really have good feedback mechanisms. They just share button reporting, fixing, sort of thing. It's not strictly necessary, you know, for, to have a free software project, but it's still sort of recognized as a, as a component that you have this software engineering methodology, I suppose, uh, it, uh, around this open source idea, and you don't really have any of that if you know, all you use is Facebook and Gmail. So how could this be addressed? So, so first of all, we need more of the of, of free web services. Because um, you know there's Gmail, which is not free either. A lot of people use that. There's no equivalent of that. It's free software. Of course, there are some web application, uh, web mail applications, but they're not really written nice. Or anything. A lot of software needs to be written. And uh, yesterday, actually, the, there was a talk, might have been actually here, or in some neighboring room by the Mozilla folks. They said that you know, the web is inherently hackable. Because you have the source code and everything, and you know, have the source code basically. It's true to some degree, but it's, I don't think it's actually really true. Of course, you have the source code, but have you actually looked at the source code of a 
complex web application. Yeah, that's, you might as well argue, well, you know, you could you can hack anything because you can reverse assemble it. But that doesn't help. And even if you can hack it, maybe it's not legal. So you need there's just a bunch of new software that needs to be written to fit into you know what people want to use right now. There's some things that are already going in that direction. Um, Identica is the uh, Twitter placement or alternative, for example. OpenStreetMap is going on, of course, as, as a, you know, Google Maps is a kind of perhaps. Some, some new things from KDE's own cloud, which is more of an initiative right now than actually the product. But they are thinking of ways to, to make their uh, software generally accessible. And there needs to be just a bunch of more things uh, in that area. We don't have any web office type things, for example. And, uh, and obviously, that would be a huge job, so it's not going to happen in the next three months, supposedly. So think more of you know what you can do to not place but to have alternatives to say Google instead of alternatives to Microsoft because that was sort of the big sort of goal of throughout the 90s perhaps you know everything that Microsoft or all these sort of companies had needs to have a free replacement and operating system that's done and there's you know, the office that's done more or less and a few other things so that's what people sort of aim for that's kind of finished right now obviously there's quality issues and various things like that but it's kind of Done now, but in, in the meantime, actually, the whole this whole new field is open of web applications that are driven by mostly Google and other uh, things, um, other companies, and uh, there's no really credible credible alternatives to much of that software. So. But those are good stores. So the second, uh, we need some kind of a um, free hosting model, and that's very hard to figure out how to actually do that. So let's think. If I am a user of free software, and I want to you know, make use of my freedoms, and, uh, and I can download the source from the original author, I can download the packaging, I can rebuild it myself, I can you know, do changes, and then use the, those, cha those change versions, that's all the things we do, right? But how, how do you do that with a, with a web service? Even if you have a free one, you know, of course they need to be, the software needs to be free first of all so you can actually look at it. And then how do you, let's say you have OpenStreetMap and you want to make some change. Because you don't like the way you're going to change the change to college. That's so how do you do that? You can't go to OpenStreetMap and go there and check the source code that's actually running and then and make changes there and then have it hosted there. It doesn't, it doesn't work, right? So, so, so it's, you can get the source code perhaps and you can get the data down from them. Then you need to basically do the whole hosting yourself. And it's obviously feasible, it's not sort of the same idea that you can just have the same software, you build it and have it running. Unchanged, you need to set up your own, you know, myopenstreetmap.org and do your things there. And, Obviously, that doesn't scale if you know, 100,000 users want to make their own changes and merge them back together or something like that. You will have like 1,000 know, open street map clones. So I, I don't know how that's actually going to work, but it's some, something. It, it, there are possible ways to do that with virtualization. You could have open street map, for example, could have like virtualization hosting of alternative branches, let's call them, and then just sort of click around, make the changes, upload them, and they have this uh, in the subdomain. I'm not sure that helps, but I don't know, but he's thinking. There's a sort of example that uh, it's not really addressing this completely, but sort of an idea of a community hosting, it's host sharing.net is a German ISP, I guess, they provide you know, DNS and web space and so on. But it's, uh, it's a non-profit association, and uh, you can sort of become a member there, and you sort of join this as admin team, and do uh, sort of join in there, and run the thing as a community to some degree. So that could be useful to sort of, sort of little draw experiences from, but uh, as I said, this is very unclear how that uh, can actually work. So the next thing is some sort of uh, the whole issue of data. 
which is never a problem if you have those local installations. With the traditional way of using software, you have the software on your own machine, and you worry about you know, is the software free, and then can I change it? But the data is always there. And sometimes it's in the format that you don't like. You always have the source that reads the format so you can uh, access that. But if the software is actually deployed somewhere else, then the data is there and you can't necessarily get to that. So that needs some sort of a policy or some ways to, to um, you know, can you A, check what's happening to your data, and B, actually get your data out of there to use it in a different uh, context, for example. And uh, so that needs some kind of, well, it's, again, depends on how this hosting works out. You know, you can't give every user a stage access to that box and let them check the logs of what's happened to their data. But ultimately, as a user, that's what I would like, but it's very impractical to run that. Data dumps are actually already happening. You can get data dumps from all of these things. And so, for example, download you know, the data as you can <laughs> and uh, there is this uh, notion in the GPL, for example, when you need, you know, the GPL requires you in some circumstances to provide the source code to the recipient of the software. And it has this notion of preferred form for modification, right? You can't just give them some random misformatted, pre built, binary, semi compiled version. You need to actually give them the source that you were using to or a reasonable person, I suppose, would use for modifying this. <coughs> the same could apply here, potentially, that you know you need to provide access in, in, uh, in, to the data in some preferred form. So you can't just give people binary dumps of your internal data format, but you need to maybe some, some recognized format. So that is pretty easy to define, and I think are people are using uh, and doing that. So that, that's pretty simple uh, part of this whole exercise here. And the, the last uh, thing to think about is this licensing in, in a licensing that sort of enforces these uh, um, issues here. And there is some, uh, there's already a license that some of you will know. It attempts to do that. It's somewhat controversial, but I think it sort of does the job for a lot of cases. That's the AGPL, the FARO, general public license. Um, and that basically says it's a GPL plus if you provide this software as a web service, I'm, I'm sort of summarizing, but it basically says you know, it's GPL plus if you provide this software as a web service and you change it, you need to make the changes available for download over a network. So, or you know, all, a written offer to ship it and things like that. So, and that essentially gets the job done if you think about something like, you know, maybe Identica. Um, <laughs> They, if you had to look at Identica, right? I can't read that actually back there. <laughs> 15 minutes, okay. Uh, if you had actually written Identica and then someone took it and actually hosted it and made some changes, they would be required to put a tarball on their website and download that. I think that makes quite a bit of sense, but there are some practical problems that have been mentioned. That, for example, what if you use some AGP, AGPL licensed software to implement or change a mail server? SMTP server. How do you make an SMTP server offer code for download? You know, and that, uh, yeah, no one knows the answer to that because the license doesn't say that you have to either, you know, you could put a link in the, was it the SMTP welcome message? And, but that, that doesn't really make any sense. That doesn't actually in practice help users. So. But you know, so the Free Software Foundation has actually approved this. So, and, and not some significant uh, projects or products are using that. So that, I think that's the way sort of things are going to go. Potentially, you know how this was like 10, 15 years ago, and sort of this free open source software took off. Everyone wrote their own license because they thought you know this is the best way to actually enforce what I want. And um, over time, this has consolidated. Maybe, maybe we're already consolidated now, or maybe there's going to be more things coming up, or maybe no one cares if none of this is going to happen. It's of course also possible. But, uh, so look for some sort of licensing issues there. So now I, I think actually some of these things are not going to sort of you know, be implemented in say like 
get rid of the door anytime soon. It means it's difficult to arrange and you know, make decisions on policies and with licenses and posting and, and so on. So I think this would you know, be opportunities for commercial vendors of Linux distributions and so on. Same way, early Linux distributions, at least many of them were commercial vendors. Right? That's what, you know, the way Red Hat and Susan got started. They assembled software and packaged it a little bit, and then they charged for that to give that to you. I right? paid, you know, I don't know how much it was, like some 50 euros. Other currency, actually, back then. So um, to get that box, and, and over time, this was sort of commoditized because you had, you know, brought that download, and now you just download things, and you can't really charge for that anymore. And now it's all open. So you open this fedora and so on. The same thing could happen here that some vendors in Ubuntu or Canonical is essentially doing that already to, to sort of define some of these things and then and make things happen and charge people for it. And over time, as as we go on. Um, you know, could be you know free, completely free community-driven alternatives to that appearing. As soon as you know these sort of things are resolved, or someone has an idea about that. So these are this is the this is a really version of the free software definition, uh, and this is from the you know, the 80s actually. This is what we've been using so far. You know, this is the foundation of you know the open source uh, definition and the open software guidelines and so on. All, all this sort of comes from that. And, uh, so this will still work, I think. Uh, if you want to, let's think about the web service. You want to have the freedom to run it. You want to have the freedom to change it. <laughs> There's some problem here. You want to have the freedom to change it and actually then redeploy that changed version in the same environment. As I mentioned, this is very difficult. Do right now. You can redistribute it, host it yourself. You can uh, you know, distribute whatever you change and so on. So this is still valid. But I think there's some additions to that. Should be thought of other people are thinking about that. So this is sort of an idea here. The issue of data is is very important. And I think that it was actually it caused them. Many years ago, Tim O'Reilly was actually on the keynote, and he was sort of going on about the control of data. That's going to be important. And back then, this was kind of yeah, 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 yeah. But actually, now it's more than current than ever. So, um, you know, I, I don't want to say you know this is the fourth fourth item here because I, I don't want to be presumptuous and sort of redefine the a definition right now. But I think this somehow needs to be integrated into the various. Uh, licensing policies and various things like that. And I don't think anyone has really addressed it in a universally recognized way right now. So here are some uh, links. It's a nice blog entry by... Is he here? No, I haven't seen him. No, no. Okay. <laughs> this very nice blog entry where he actually went through various uh, sort of freedoms and then rights he would like to have and then compare various services like you know Facebook, Identica, and email and things like that against that. And, and actually this uh, well known person had a talk, Freedom in the Cloud on Friday actually, and I have not seen it, but obviously it's kind of the same idea. Now check this morning the video wasn't up yet, but there was a link video coming. Be very interesting to look into it. If you just Google this exact, I guess I don't know if you're allowed to Google it anymore now. Hearing this, but uh, if you want to search with the free search provider of choice for this, you will, you will find it. It would be very interesting. As I said, I've not seen it. So, so to uh, conclude, um, this you know you can just ignore that because other people will do it. But ultimately, this will make Linux distributors marginalized, perhaps, or other people will do it in ways you would like, because they will not you know, use the same sort of standards of freedom and, and integration and so on. So think about what, what you know, in your 
project and so on that we work on. So how, how can you take all this cloud software and maybe write a new cloud software and integrate it to make it into a nice package that you can uh, and ship to your users in the way they would you know, expect it now or certainly in a couple of years from now. And uh, think about ways to, new ways to distribute software instead of shipping in ISO images. And, you know, you download the ISO image version on CD, installed and you throw the CD away. That's so, think about new ways to distribute software and um, think about freedom in the cloud. Maybe look at a talk uh, by Ian Norman or think about new ways to augment the uh, definitions of freedom that you use for yourself. So. And as we make these distributions, I think we should be at the center of this uh, of drive. Uh, questions? There's one question. Um, the Eucalyptus project, yes. I suppose that's the purpose is to install virtual machines from scratch. Is, is there much similarity between it and the spacewalk? Between that and what? And the spacewalk? Uh, I, I don't know that so much. So the question was is this Eucalyptus similar to spacewalk? I don't actually know spacewalk. So. What is that? Yeah. yeah, so this is the problem with process. So. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. This is something to figure out and blog about afterwards. What the Eucalyptus actually does is this, what I, you know, it's like a screenshot of what the is. It's basically a web interface to say, I want this sort of machine and I want to install it to A, Amazon, or B, my private cloud, or any future cloud things. Yeah. This blog is sort of a Primary granularity that the real life maybe different packages and so on, but you can see that there could be sort of crossover between the two. Certainly, there's going to be you know 15 package managers initially, and maybe two left. <laughs> it's all starting. Yes. I was with Cisco guys three days ago, and they said to me that there is an NIS group working on the definition, an exact definition of what is the cloud. Is there a work within the community uh, NIS team to set the definition of the cloud? Which NIS team are you referring to? Uh, I, I don't have the, the right reference. I think I could give it to you, but uh, apparently there is a, a working group. You, you, you mean like APIs for deploying cloud servers and things like that? Yes, there, so the question was there's a working group apparently to define what cloud is. So there are standardization efforts going on. You know, people say that the IETF and so on. And they think about ways to standardize various interfaces to these services. So this is work going on and uh, to, to be followed. Yes, it's all happening right now, so that's why I'm talking about this here, so you can look for it. Other questions? Okay, then thank you.